Welcome back, folks, to the second of my videos about proteins. This is the fourth time I've tried to do this. It's easy to see this is not my area of expertise. This is Dr. Borthwick's ex area of expertise. Um, so, I want to talk about the structure and functions of proteins in living creatures. Uh, we'll probably use humans, uh, as they are the easiest living creatures to demonstrate. Uh, the fact that we are it's basically just walking collections of proteins means that we need to, you are what you eat. You know the phrase, you are what you eat? Well, it's totally true. All these proteins here are all built up from the food I've been eating in previous uh, weeks and months. So that means if I'm going to stitch amino acids together to make the proteins required for my what little remains of my hair or my skin, then I'm going to have to have eaten them. Uh, and we need a certain number of amino acids in our diet. These are called essential amino acids. I can't quite remember how many there are. I'll go and find out and I'll put it in the doobly-doo down below the video. Um, but they are absolutely required in your grub. And we tend to get them from eating dead animals. But as it turns out, in fact, ironically, you can't get all your amino acids that are essential from animals. You really, really need some plants. Um, which is why you could survive on a diet of just plants forever. And you couldn't survive on a diet of just animals forever. You'd be very ill. Uh, so, amino acids in your diet are required to stitch together to make proteins. Let's have a look at the structure and function of proteins in the body. There are there are two things that your proteins do for you. Number one, basically, uh, make you up. That's what you're built from. So, all your muscles and all your skin and tissues are all built from proteins. These are called structural proteins. They tend to be sheets or um, spirals or other long, complex shapes. Um, and they are structural, as in skin is amazingly strong stuff. Why is that? Well, for example, if we have... Let's, let's simplify things massively. Here's a big long protein chain. Here's a neighbouring protein chain. Uh, and along these proteins, of course, you will find nitrogens and hydrogens. And the next door neighbour, you'll also find nitrogen and hydrogen. And in one here, you might find a C double bond O. And in here, you'll also find a C double bond O. This is hugely simplified, but... If you cast your minds back to bonding, uh, then you will remember that this is delta negative, that is delta plus, and it's the same for these two. So you actually get hydrogen bonds here holding one chain of this protein to its neighbouring chain. You'll also, this, this isn't hydrogen bonds here, I'm hoping you can tell me, I'm going to use a different colour because it's not hydrogen bonds. These are permanent dipole, permanent dipole attractions between the oxygen and the carbon, because that's delta minus, that's delta plus. So there are forces, intermolecular forces, holding uh, one strand of protein in my skin to the neighbouring strand, and that's what makes it incredibly tough and strong. Um, there's a consequence of that later on, by the way, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's have a look at the second function of... Uh, let's have a look at the second function of proteins in the body and that is very often as a catalyst so enzymes basically are what keep us all alive because our chemical reactions that would normally happen at wild and wonderful temperatures are able to run at 37 celsius courtesy of enzymes in your body they regulate all your biochemistry again you're outside my field talk to dr borthwick um or possibly a must cloud as well, basically anybody except me, I'm just a pure chemist. So enzymes, if these are mainly, mainly sheets, enzymes are more interesting. Enzyme proteins, like for example, hemoglobin, tend to be, believe or no, I'm not actually making this up, uh, crazy structures like this. They tend to be globular proteins. Now, once again, globular proteins though, are actually held in that shape by uh, intermolecular forces, because they still have things like this here. So therefore, you're still going to have hydrogen bonds holding your glob in its shape. And if you do biology, you'll know that the shape of an enzyme is absolutely essential to getting it to work properly. It's called the lock and key effect. This enzyme here, sorry, this enzyme here is able to grab onto whatever molecule it reacts with because it is the correct shape. And it's only the correct shape if these are all uh, in their correct order and strength. Which sort of takes us to point number three, denaturing. Is it possible to break these intermolecular bonds? Uh, and yes, it is. There's two ways to do it. You can 
give it enough uh, thermal energy to shake them apart. So uh, what would happen if you increase the temperature of this too much? And the answer is you would break these intermolecular forces. So method number one is raise the temperature. And that is why we boil stuff or cook stuff before we eat it. One of the reasons is for sterilization because you're destroying the enzymes in the bacteria on the food. That's the main reason to cook things, believe it or not. It's to make sure there's nothing else alive or we boil it or whatever, but it kills off all the bacteria. And that's how it actually kills bacteria. It disrupts these intermolecular forces or, of course, these intermolecular forces, which is slightly more important, in the enzymes in the bacteria and kills them stone dead. There is a second way, which is what my prop is for. Pickled onions, or in this case, pickled beetroot. How does that survive in a jar? for months or years on end and not go off? And the answer is because you've changed, if you want to pause the video, take a wild guess, you've changed the pH. So if you plonk bacteria or fungi in acid or alkali conditions, although acid works best because we can eat them, um, then you disrupt these, you change the shape of the, the enzymes and therefore you stop them functioning. I think that's all I want to say, actually. Just one last point in case I didn't make it clear. Um, when I clear off to have a... What am I having for tonight's tea? Um, mushroom pizza, in fact. So the base of the pizza bread is just carbohydrate, but the mushrooms I, and anything else that I want to put on it are proteins. So what I will do over the next few days with these mushrooms is basically I will take big long chains of structural protein from the mushroom. I will break them apart using enzymes in my stomach and the acid in my stomach, which is also why your stomach is full of hydrochloric acid. So we will break um, the peptide links in the proteins and the mushrooms. We'll separate the mushrooms out into all the individual amino acids. They soak through your small intestine into your blood and then they get reassembled into more me. How clever is that? So basically digestion of food is hydrolysis. And then you got a condensation reaction occurring inside the cells. But we're treading well into biology's territory here, so I'm going to stop right there. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye.